Justin Steinberg is the Associate Professor of Philosophy at Berkeley College CUNY and the CUNY Graduate Center. His book, uh, Spinoza's Political Psychology, will appear later this year in Cambridge University Press. Dr. Steinberg will examine Spinoza's view of affective process and judgment and ways to reduce our own judgmental attitudes. Please welcome Dr. Justin Steinberg. Um, okay. So, I'll try to remember to speak into the mic, but I'll um, check in with the people in the back to make sure you can hear me. Um, all right, so I have three aims of today's talk. The, the first is kind of just the theme of the conference. Uh, it goes a little bit beyond what I think most people are talking about, but um, I'm going to establish that we are on Spinoza's account. Actually, can you hear me in the back if I just project? Yeah. That way I don't have to lean off of the board. Okay, so uh, I'm going to establish that we are, on Spinoza's account, judgmental by nature, and not just in the belief default sense, we're also evaluatively judgmental by nature. Sure. <laughs> I'm just uncomfortable with mics. <laughs> Um, the second thing I'm going to say, the second aim of the talk, is to explore uh, the consequences of being judgmental by nature. How this, taken together with other features of Spinoza's theory of cognition, leads us into hostile relationships with others. It leads ultimately to civic unrest. And the third aim is to consider what resources Spinoza has for reining in the impulse to impose our judgment on others. And if time permits, I'll also say something about how we might reconcile evaluative commitment, that is when we retain our judgment to some extent, with tolerance. So we'll see how much I can get to. First, a little bit of overview that I think I don't need to spend a lot of time on. For Spinoza, all ideas are intrinsically affirmative. They are belief-like in their very nature. So this is a quote that most people in the room are probably familiar with. In the mind, there is no volition or affirmation and negation, except that which the idea involves, insofar as it is an idea. The upshot of this, um, or taking this together with some of the things that Spinoza has to say about what constitutes a belief or judgment, leads to what I call uh, the dominance model of belief, according to which an idea constitutes a belief if and only if it's stronger than other ideas with countervailing content. We get uh, um, we get evidence that this is his view. Yeah, it was a better Pegasus than the other Pegasus pictures that I did on my quick Google search. Um, if the mind perceived nothing else, so he's responding to the Cartesian. I'm, I'm not going to belabor this because I assume this was discussed already and will continue to be discussed, but. This is a response to the Cartesian view of belief formation, uh, according to which we have separate faculties of intellect and will. Um, and Spinoza is basically accepting the consequences of, of his view, which is to say, if we just perceive something, we would believe it in the absence of other ideas. So if the mind perceived nothing else except a winged horse, it would regard it as present to itself and would have no cause of doubting its existence. Now, on that basic picture, uh, many have pointed out that this seems to leave us susceptible to propaganda and fake news, and I think that's right. I think the situation is actually much worse when we add the affective component, um, which Spinoza describes quite well in the beginning of the theolog theological political treatise. Um, here he's basically, he opens saying we typically desire uncertain things, and we basically vacillate between hope and fear, so that when we are able to uh, obtain those things that are uncertain, we feel proud and we resist counsel. But when we're unable to obtain those things, we're in the state of fear. Nevertheless, 
Our mind is buoyant. We're striving to affirm things that give us joy. So we seek our environment for sources of hope. Basically, this renders us deeply credulous um, as we seek to find some way to satisfy um, our, uh, some way to advance our, our striving. Okay, that's what I have to say in the way of my discussion of theoretical judgments. Now I want to go beyond theoretical judgments and talk about evaluative judgments. And the way in here is to talk about the emotions. So for Spinoza, emotions are just a species of idea. They're intentional in their, um, in their structure. So uh, one bit of evidence that Spinoza has an intentional theory of emotion is this third axiom in part two. There are no modes of thinking such as love, desire, or whatever is designated by the word affects of mind, unless there is in the same individual the idea of the thing loved, desired, and the like. So basically, as we perceive the environment, we represent things in the environment. And as we represent them impacting our power of action to use this technical language, we necessarily respond affectively. Emotions are expressions of changes of, uh, in our power of acting. And so when we have emotions, we are positing the existence of the thing, and we're representing the thing as in some way impinging on my power. From there, he argues, I would, I would defend this interpretation, not everybody agrees with me here, but I think he, he thinks that all evaluative judgments reduce to affects or desires. So um, we represent the environment around us emotionally, and when we do so, we thereby judge things. We're appraising our environment via our affects. So I won't actually spend much time looking at these quotes, and these are only suggestive, they don't provide the whole account, but I think I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna assert and defend if necessary in q and A. I'm going to assert that his view is basically captured by this one, the cognition of good and evil, which is to say representing things as good or evil is nothing but the affect uh, of joy or sadness. Insofar as we're conscious of it, that is sort of uh, an unnecessary qualifier for reasons that I won't go into. So what this means is that for Spinoza, perception emotional response and evaluative judgment, they're not discrete moments. It's not like we first perceive, then we respond effectively, and then we judge. All of that is just a single package. We perceive the world in a valence, affective, and evaluative way. And you can see from this why that makes us naturally judgmental. Insofar as this is just how we perceive the environment, we're necessarily taking some sort of evaluative relationship to it. So what do we make then of the culture of not being judgmental? So um, it's a perfectly natural thing uh, to, to say something snarky and then have somebody say to you, don't be so judgmental. We live in a culture where being judgmental is a bad thing. Um, is it just incoherent to say, don't be so judgmental? Well, in a sense, um, if what you mean is don't judge in this instance, on Spinoza's view that actually is incoherent because we don't have direct voluntary control over our affects, so we don't have direct voluntary control over our judgments. But what I want to pursue in what follows is the extent to which we actually do maybe have control over our judgments. Whether we can, in fact, be a little less judgmental. So what does Spinoza have to say on, on being less judgmental? Well, on the one hand, based on what we've already seen, Spinoza, in fact, does deny, he denies that we have a free power to suspend judgment. So unlike the Stoics, uh, unlike Descartes, he seems to think that uh, we, we, can't, we can't just simply, in a particular instance, diffuse an emotional response or diffuse our evaluation via an act of, of will. On the other hand, this is what I want to stress, Spinoza does claim in his unfinished political treatise that to suspend judgment is a rare virtue. So what I want to consider from here is, first, 
why does Spinoza think that suspending judgment is desirable? You might think that actually we shouldn't suspend judgment, we should just be better judges. Like we should be more discriminate, and that's what matters. But in fact, Spinoza does seem to think suspending judgment is a virtue, being a little less judgmental is a virtue. <clears throat> the second question that I'll be pursuing is how we can suspend judgment. Right? If, in fact, our judgments are expressed by our affects, how can we be less judgmental? How can we tamp down our emotional responses? So start, start, let's start with the first question. Why is suspending judgment desirable? Well, I'm going to start in sort of a funny place, because um, what I want to show is that in virtue of our uh, judgmental natures combined with other tendencies of mind, we wind up in deeply antagonistic relationships with others. And one of the other features of mind that contributes to this is the imitation of affects, which at first blush would seem to bring us actually into harmony with one another. So it's a little surprising. So the imitation of affects is basically um, a sort of principle of empathy or emotional contagion. If we imagine thing, a thing like us towards which we have no affect, so towards which we're otherwise neutral, to be affected by some affect, we are thereby affected with a like affect. So we, we wind up sort of resonating with others. And a further expression of this, just a further extension of this, is what he calls emulation. So that's when others' desires breed desires in us. We emulate their desires. So from that, what happens is when we encounter someone with a different affective relationship to something than our own, we experience this as a vacillation because I have my antecedent emotional response. Now I'm confronted with somebody who has a divergent emotional response that I internalize, and now I'm in this state of vacillation. So what happens is this external conflict, the fact that you and I have different emotional re responses to something, um, that gets internalized for me as a form of cognitive dissonance. And it's a little bit anachronistic to say that Spinoza had a theory of cognitive dissonance, but I think he did. Um, and he also thought that we seek to reduce cognitive dissonance. He thought this was an unstable uh, situation. So a certain degree of cognitive dissonance on account of diverg di divergent emotional responses is inevitable. Um, but to the extent that we can, we seek to reduce this. We seek coherency in our own belief and evaluative systems. And there's a little bit of textual evidence to that effect that I'm just going to skip over. How am I on time? About like 10 minutes? Or? Yeah, 12. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to outline four ways of reducing cognitive dissonance. The first two are in, in Spinoza's theory. The first two are really benign. One we could call epistemic convergence. So you and I have different affective responses to something, and now we justify or we seek to justify or give reasons for why we're responding in the way that we are. And one or maybe both parties modify their beliefs and, and in turn their emotions follow suit on the basis of new evidence, new reasons, and argumentation. And Spinoza does seem to think this some, sometimes happens through deliberation that we come to recognize that we were confused and we modify our judgment accordingly. This is one of the reasons, one of several reasons, why Spinoza thinks that deliberative democracies are good things. Another way that cognitive dissonance could be reduced is uh, through some more affective route. And typically I would say um, on these benign versions of reducing cognitive dissonance, the two probably go together in a way. But on the affective account, um, one or both parties might modify their beliefs so as to win the esteem of the other. So I recognize that I'm out of step with you, and I respect you, um, and maybe from a sense of shame, 
um, uh, fear that I'm going to be an outcast or an outlier, I, my, my own emotional responses start to modify as a result of that. So I accommodate my beliefs, I accommodate my judgments to win others' approval. Um, the problem is those benign forms of reducing cognitive dissonance, I think, are actually relatively rare. So one of the reasons that they're rare is that we are, in Spinoza's technical terms, we're all to some degree ambitious. And what does he mean by ambition? He means the tendency to try to get others to live in accordance with your own mentality. Um, so there's a lot to say about this. Um, but the idea is that, well, actually, let me introduce the second part. That will make it easier to explain. The idea is that we're ideologically protective. We tend to try to preserve our own belief systems. And there's, all, there's various forms of textual uh, evidence to support that this is, in fact, Spinoza's view. Um, you may be aware, maybe even talked about it yesterday, of Spinoza's theory of striving. All things strive to persevere in their being and are only destroyed by external causes. Um, and this is also true of ideas and uh, ideological systems. So we strive to affirm what we affirm and love what we love with the utmost constancy. And it's painful to modify antecedent judgments. It would be much better if others would conform to us rather than we conform, or rather than, than, than us conforming to others. And the more deeply entrenched one's value of judgments are, the more resistant we will be to adapt. Okay? So this helps to explain things like, like the backfire effect. So we've got these deeply entrenched beliefs. They clash with some bit of evidence that's presented to us, and we strive to maintain our antecedent belief system which means finding ways to repudiate the new information, to delegitimate the new information. Okay, so what do we get out of ambition and ideological preservationism? Well, we get the fourth, or sorry, the third way of producing cognitive dissonance, which is hatred. Now, this wouldn't happen over uh, picky in matters like what kind of music you listen. Well, I guess it could. But this is probably things that affect sort of the core of your evaluative systems. When somebody's out of step with that, the easiest way for you to reduce that internal dissonance is actually to come to hate them. Because when you come to hate them, you no longer imitate their affects. So that's a nice way of protecting yourself. Right? Now I'm no longer going to be internalizing your affective attitude. And now I no longer feel that sense of cognitive dissonance. I no longer feel that vacillation. Um, so we're primed actually to, in some ways, be at odds with one another, and maybe primed to hate those who respond in different effective ways than we do. And it actually gets much, much worse. There's a long story to tell that I'm just going to basically skip over. But it gets much, much worse, Spinoza thinks, um, when there's a very powerful relig religious element to this, when there's a powerful clergy who's ambitious and um, who's fueling anxiety, credulity, keeping the masses fixed to their message. All of that promotes superstition, and it feeds people's basic ambition. It feeds people's persecutive tendencies. So for that reason, he writes a whole work that's really, in my opinion, that really aims to undermine clerical authority. OK, so that tells us you know, why it's desirable to be a little less judgmental if we care about civil harmony. Um, if we can be a little less hateful, that would probably be good on the whole for civil order. So here's the fourth way of reducing dissonance. This is the good way. This is what Spinoza seemingly wants, at least in some cases, and we can talk a little bit about that. I don't think he wants us to forsake all of our judgments. But I think, I think he thinks, in a lot of cases, our evaluations um, put us at loggerheads with one another unnecessarily and breed unnecessary strife. 
So let's suspend our judgment layer. Let's tolerate. But of course, this raises that second question about the possibility of suspension of judgment, given what we know about Spinoza's theory of mind. So when Spinoza talks about suspending judgment, this is how he describes it. Obviously, it doesn't involve an act of will. So what does go on when you suspend your judgment? It's just another, um, it's another idea. It's particularly a second order idea, the perception of the inadequacy of your first order idea. That's what suspension of judgment consists in. So I'll just read this so you, you know I'm not just making this up. When we say that someone suspends judgment, we are saying nothing but that he sees that he does not perceive the thing adequately. Judge, uh, suspension of judgment, therefore, is really a perception, not an act of free will. So he's, he's able to account for what suspension of judgment will uh, amount to, given his, um, his view that all ideas are belief-like. Okay, so we can just quickly look. Actually, we can skip over this. I just wanted to show the Pegasus one more time. Um, so here's, here's another example. So in Spinoza, a lot of the sort of cognitive therapy is really about um, the same process whereby we adopt second order, higher order ideas to hold in check um, misguided first order ideas. So here would be an example. It's, it's not exactly like toleration or suspending judgment, but it has, it shares certain features. So um, imagine that, uh, I, maybe this would be good for something people, it wouldn't be good for me. Um, imagine that I'm craving a whiskey at like noon. Um, well, in craving it, in desiring it, I'm also judging it to be good, right? Based on what I said about the constitution theory that the value of judgments are constituted by desires. However, I might be able to perceive the inadequacy of that judgment. So I crave it and thereby judge it to be good, but I can also stand back and say, wait a second, um, what would the effects of whiskey drinking be like? And I can adopt a more rational, on Spinoza's view, time neutral way of apprehending the effects. So I think of the sleepiness, I think of the incapacitation. Interestingly, maybe I imitate the affects of my future self a little bit better. And when I do that, I'm able to hold in check that initial desire. So that would be a, a, a different kind of instance, or one kind of instance, of where we adopt higher order judgments to, to rein in our, our first order idea. Um, what's different about toleration is that it doesn't replace one dubious judgment with a better one. That would be to revise your belief, not just to suspend it. Um, so instead, he's thinking of cases where, uh, look, I have an emotional relationship to something, so I evaluate it, but I can also recognize that my emotional relationship to it might just be a reflection of my own happenstance encounters, it might be a relationship of my own upbringing, and in that sense, I, uh, I can perceive the inadequacy of this judgment as universal for others. So that's where I'm ultimately going to go. I see I have two minutes, so I'm going to try to be the same. Um, so I guess what I want to consider here is cases of toleration that don't necessarily involve fully suspending your judgment, these are, I think, more pervasive. So I can recognize the sense of contingency in the music that I like. I can recognize that not everybody should like the music that I like. Um, but I can still like the music that I like, right? I can still be committed to it. So I think this is the, the challenge for most of us when it comes to toleration. Can you, um, in some way, recognize that your effective attitude is not universal while still being committed to it in some way. And I think Spinoza has some, some great things to say about this, so I'm going to skip over a couple of slides and just get to that. So what I want to propose is that one of the important ways in which we can suspend judgment is that we can suspend the scope of our judgment, according to Spinoza. So, I can perceive the inadequacy of the scope without renouncing the content. So I'll just read this one quote. I think there are lots of other quotes in the TTP that support this. 
but he recognizes one and the same thing can be at the same time good, bad, and also indifferent. For instance, music is good for one who is melancholy, bad for one who is mourning, and neither good nor bad for one who is deaf. And I can do this with a lot of my evaluative judgments, with a lot of my emotional relationships to things. I can recognize that this might be true for me, this might be good for me, this might enhance my power of acting, while recognizing that it probably doesn't, or doesn't necessarily enhance others' power of acting. And so that's a form of genuine tolerance. Um, I'm almost done. I got, I got the um, The other thing that I want to say is we can also kind of expressively suspend judgment, which is to say we can recognize how counterproductive it is on Spinoza's account. We can recognize how counterproductive it is to try to impose our views of, on others because we recognize everybody else's ideologically preservational as well. So there's a sense in which um, we can still cleave to our own judgments while recognizing that it's not good to express them in the way that we would like to because it's just going to um, it's just going to rile people up. So I'll end on this. Um, from all of this, we get a kind of a plea for epistemic humility. To reduce tribalism, we must actively work to cultivate awareness of the contingency of many of our own value judgments, checking our natural chauvinism and overconfidence, and we must try to engage others in ways that acknowledge human variability. Thank you. Thank you, that was fascinating. Um, so, uh, I have a question about the idea that you have at the end about epistemic humility, uh, which seems very nice and okay. Um, there's, a, there's a potential worry that comes up um, from the literature on moral psychology. That I, don't, I don't think it shows that this is totally false or anything, but it's just a worry. Um, uh, the work of people like Linda Skitka um, seems to suggest that uh, our second order attitudes towards our moral first order moral judgments actually has an impact on the strength of our first order moral judgments. So people who are, have a less kind of universalist, objectivist attitude towards their uh, first order moral judgments are less likely to make an important to their first order moral judgments and less likely to hold them as strongly. Yeah. So it does seem like there's this kind of give and take between you know, tolerance on the one hand does seem to reduce like these, uh, you know, what Spinoza regards as these negative, um, affective responses to moral disagreement. But then, on the other hand, it also seems to reduce our ability to, to, to make moral decisions and act on our moral beliefs. So, yeah. I was wondering if you have any thoughts about that kind of trade-off, and if you think it's it's still worth it, or yeah, that's really interesting. So, I think for yeah, it's it's tricky. So, for a lot of the things where we <coughs> perceive the inadequacy of our first order judgment. Um, it actually would be a perfectly good thing for that higher order judgment to erode our first order commitment. So if that's what the moral psychology is showing, I think Spinoza would regard that as a good thing for most matters. But then there are other things where we don't want to renounce the first order judgment. And I, I just wonder if the moral psych really runs contrary to Spinoza's view, because my suspicion is um, the kind of second order judgment that he would have in mind, which is recognizing the scope restriction or something like that, I can't imagine that would have erode your commitment in the same way. So, yeah, what you're, what you're asking questions about goes to the couple of slides that I skipped over. I'm super interested in it. Maybe we can talk about it. Talk about it. Go to coffee. Good question. Thanks. Okay, so I was interested in what you said about um, resorting to hate to reduce cognitive dissonance. Um, and I've actually like noticed that in myself, like sometimes where I'm like struggling with something, like you know, like in a relationship, and then it's like, oh, I could just hate this person, and then the mind is like, ah, oh, like that feels so it's good, good, right? Yeah. So, so is it just that like hate is just a stronger emotion than like whatever the dissonance is producing and and so that so like resorting to it just gives us like respite from the dissonance and if so like are there other ways other kind of affective ways where we could just like supercharge on another 
emotion or something that would just wash out like the distance. Yeah, that makes okay. sense. Yeah, yeah. So I think your description is, is quite quite in keeping with Spinoza's thinking. Like that, it feels like a bit of a relief to just arrive at that feeling of hate, where you now have a sense of stability in your own mind. Um, but of course, Spinoza is one of the things that he says, perhaps implausibly. I find I would like to be persuaded of this. He says, "Love destroys hate." So, if we could supercharge love in some way, that's that's a, that would be a much bigger story to tell. But it would have to be part of his story of tolerance: is that we have to come to to love people, um, and part of the story there is also coming to understand why people are the way they are and see that they are just expressions of God or nature. So, all of that's going to help to erode these negative aspects too. But the point is, initially, we have this proclivity towards hate because it just does give us a sense of stability. Yeah, I, I just wanted to put on um, the, the discussion just then. Uh, we need to emphasize, I think, that hate recovery. You should have used another regards to hate as an intrinsic bad yeah, aspect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because it's it involves, sad. essentially involves sadness. So yeah. It may be good because of its effects in certain situations and stuff. But the, I don't think you would think it's something that involves a sense of relief. Oh, uh, so I think, it, I, yeah, you and I just might disagree about this. I, I, think, it, I think it would. Um, but obviously, I totally agree, it's not a good thing. Um, it's, a sign of, it's a sign of my sadness. But that sadness comes from a reduction of the dissonance, and um, our minds are kind of wired to produce dissonance. So there is a sense. So people in the back can come up to the microphone. Um, I'm curious just in terms of the, the Western uh, theory of, of all of this. Central to me is just this idea about the corresponding uh, correspondence theory of uh, truth that uh, reality meets the mind at some point and there is such a thing as fair-mindedness. Um, so maybe just a sentence or two about that. I mean, that just seems so fundamental to how we function as human beings. So what, when you say fair-mindedness, what, what do you mean? Like well, that, that it, there's something um, that's different than bias and prejudice. That, to the, to the conclusion of your comments, the, the idea that you can weigh evidence and pick the better or most fair thought between yeah. alternatives based on the evidence you get. Well, okay, so sort of proportionality and fairness is, is part of the story here. Um, that's part of what you're perceiving to be inadequate about your own responses is, I think on Spinoza's view, most of our evaluative judgment, which is to say most of our affective appraisals of things, are haphazard, are inappropriate, are distorted and exaggerated in various ways. And so one of the things we're trying to do is adopt a more properly calibrated affective relationship to things. So yeah, that is, that is part of the story. I don't know if that answers you entirely. Would you say that um, this view of Spinoza on cognitive dissonance is uh, consistent with his view of determinism and no free will? Why would it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so the problem. Yeah, I, I'm just saying. Because I mean, yeah, I mean, you're you're implying you're implying during the slide a little bit that you can choose to do these things and oh yeah, right. Right. that language I shouldn't have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this is more just the I, I would put it in terms of the, the mind's pursuing the path of least resistance when it comes to cognitive distance, and in some cases we can achieve the reduction of cognitive distance via just effective convergence. Maybe it's not a, it's a it's on the outer periphery of my web of evaluative judgments, and so I can easily modify mine to get in accordance with yours. Um, but in some cases, it runs so deep, it goes so much to my core that the path of least resistance is actually hatred. So, you no, know, this plays out entirely in terms of determinism. Let's take one more. I have a question about affective <laughs> convergence. Uh, so to what extent do you think that it reflects an actual change in belief? Yeah, so I mean, for Spinoza, uh, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, yeah, they're kind of like this in Solomon Ash, sort of, it's 
studies and questions of when we perform or we actually should our so judgment altered um, by these affective, you know, the desire to conform to that affect the way we perceive things. I don't think it's the most helpful story to tell, so so I, I could only speculate. But, you know, I don't know. It's, like, it's, good, it's something I've wondered, but I don't, I don't know that I have much on the basis of Spinoza's text to say. All right, one more round of applause. Thank you, guys.